Hi everybody, so today we're going to be talking about oligodendrocytes, so let's jump right into this. And basically, what are oligodendrocytes? Well, these are glial cells, and like we saw in the other, in the other videos I make, is that glial cells are basically the cells that are in the nervous system that are not nerves. But for the most part, oligodendrocytes are located in the central nervous system. I am going to do another video on their counterparts, which are called Schwann cells. But what do they do? Oligodendrocytes are responsible for making myelin. So they're going to make myelin, and they're also going to be responsible, they're going to store iron, right? They're going to store iron, and they're also going to be responsible for maintaining homeostasis. So let's go ahead and jump in and take a look at this. And so the first thing we have to do is we have to look at what do we mean when we say that they store and when they make myelin. So let's go ahead and take a look. So let's go ahead and take a look, and what we're looking at right now is that this is an unmyelinated axon, okay, and then this one's going to be myelinated, that's down here. So this is what happens in an unmyelinated axon, is when an impulse comes down, our sodium gates open, and sodium is going to rush in. Then potassium is going to go out. Then sodium is going to rush in. Then potassium is going to go out, and then sodium is going to come in, and then potassium is going to go out, and then sodium is going to rush in, and then potassium is going to rush out, and so on, right, until it gets down to the presynaptic terminal. This here is what we call continuous continuous conduction. Okay, that's continuous conduction, okay? Now we're going to look at this down here. So this is going to be my myelinated axon right here. So it has myelin on it. Right, there's myelin. And there's myelin. Okay, that's going to be right there. And then if you notice, between the myelin, we have spaces, okay? And I only drew two places of myelin. Remember, this is going to be going down the whole axon. So these spaces here that's in here, that's between the myelin, we're going to call this a node of Ranvier. Okay, so there's my node of Ranvier. And then what's going to happen is in this case what's going to happen is I am going to have sodium come rushing in, and then I'm going to start to get this buildup of sodium in here. Okay, and then, of course, I'm still going to have potassium going out, and I just drew this potassium channel down here. I'm not drawing it, but these are basically in the nodes, and then these are in the paranodal space. But anyway, so as I get this buildup of sodium in here, this looks like it might be a part of the axon. It's actually surrounding the axon. I'm going to draw a picture of it in just a minute. But this looks like, so what's going to happen now is we're going to have the sodium come down this way, okay, and it's going to go down to this next area, down to this node of Ranvier, right? And then when it does, this sodium gate's going to open, and then I'm going to get sodium come rushing in, and I have more sodium in here, right? And then, of course, you're still going to have your potassium going out. And then what's going to happen is this is going to continue down, right? The sodium's going to continue down, and then eventually what's going to happen is this is going to rush in, and then we're going to have the potassium going out, but it's going to continue down. But now if you look at it, what it looks like, what's happening is it doesn't have to go in and out like it did up here, right? It can go through where the myelin is in there, right? So we call this saltatory conduction. So this is going to be called saltatory conduction when you have myelin, okay? This is going to go much faster, depending on the source. This can go up to almost 300 miles an hour. This can be as slow as 2 miles per hour, just depending on the sources that you have. All right, so that's basically what myelin's going to do. Is it's, I'm sorry, oligo, oligodendrocytes are going to make the myelin on there. So let's take a look at what happens with this, okay? So I'm going to erase this up here. And let's say that we had a nerve up here that we wanted to have myelinated. So 
I'm just going to draw this as my axon here. Okay. Now, you're going to, you can have an oligodendrocyte, and it can have up to 15 to 30 processes on there. Draw this a little bit bigger. So this is my oligodendrocyte now that's on here. And it can have up to 15 to 30 processes. And what it does when it wants to myelinate an axon is it will actually grow, it will actually grow out and then surround the axon. Okay, and then, and then now this is myelinated, right? So this is the myelin here, right? And that's going to be myelinated now, right? And like I said, it can do, we can have up to 15 to 20 processes. To give you an idea of what this is going to look like now, and this is during development. So what this is going to look like is something like this. Let's say we have an axon over here, and it needs to be, it needs to have myelin on it. Here you're looking at the axons going back and forth like this. This is as if we're looking at the axon like this. So like we said, during development, what's going to happen is this is going to grow out towards this way. Now, if you recall, this is still a cell membrane in my oligodendrocyte, right? So the cell membrane is going to have a lipid bilayer here. And then remember, it also has a lipid bilayer here, right? And lipid bilayers are made up of lipids, right? So myelin is going to be made up of lipids and proteins. So we're going to have proteins in here too. But if you also remember, inside of here, we have a gel-like substance called the cytoplasm. So as this grows out, I'm just going to draw this as, a, as if it's just a singular thing going around it. But it's going to wrap around this. Okay, It's going to start to wrap around it. And what it can do is it can wrap around this up to 300 times. Okay, And I'm making it look like a single line, right? But in actuality, imagine we have both of this going all the way around with the cytoplasm in the middle. Once it's done wrapping around this, and like we said, it could be up to 300 times. Once it's done wrapping around it, what it's going to do is it's basically going to kick this cytoplasm out. So the cytoplasm is going to leave, right? And when that cytoplasm leaves, this process is called compaction. And because of that now, this gets tighter and tighter and tighter in here. All right, so this is going to get tighter and tighter around this axon. Uh, and now, basically what I end up with is my myelin sheath. But in this case, remember, we're looking at it from the side here. Now you're looking straight down on it. But this is what it's going to look like here. And that's basically how my oligodendrocyte is going to form the myelin that's on there. So let's talk about some other things that oligodendrocytes do. So the other thing it's going to do is on oligodendrocytes, you're going to have a protein. And this protein, we're going to call it transferrin. And transferrin is going to be responsible for bringing in iron. So it's going to bring iron into the oligodendrocyte. Now inside this oligodendrocyte, I am going to have another protein. And we're going to call this ferritin. And what ferritin is going to be responsible for is storing the iron. But why do we need the iron? Well, the iron is going to help make ATP. It's going to act as a coenzyme and make an ATP. It's also going to act as a coenzyme in converting cholesterol and lipids into nutrients that the, uh, the myelin can use or to make a new myelin. Okay, so now the next thing that's going to happen, let's say that we're having a change in the pH here, right? So we're starting to get a buildup of H of bicarbonate. Well, what this can do is inside of the, inside of our oligodendrocyte, you have an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. And what this can do is it can actually bring this in with the, with the hydrogen ion, and it can convert this into water and CO2, right? I skipped the carbonic acid uh, step in there. So it can convert that into, uh, into water and CO2. And it can work the other way, just depending on what's going on with the pH. So it can act as a buffer in the pH. 
That's it for Legal Dendrocytes. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like and subscribe button, and we will catch you next time.